Thursday, usually at, at 3. Today is about 3.30. Uh, I just caught up on Oh, wow. That's very generous of him. What's he up to now? Is he, re is he retired? or? or? No, he uh, is at a, um, a different practice. He left Fleming, and he's at Martin Walden, um, based in, um, in Webster. But uh, he was telling me about a case that they're working with, with uh, Chase Bank on a two point, litigating a $2.5 billion uh -huh. Exxon oil deal dispute. Oh, wow. Uh, so he's de definitely very, very much still in the game. Well, I'm glad. Well, you, you tell him I say hi. I'll do that. And sure. if he, he said Monday at 3? Thursdays. Thursdays at 3? I'm probably here. If you want to come grab me. I'm okay. in my office. Just come grab me. Come say hi for a minute. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I'd be happy to come say hi to him. He'll be here for a half an hour. Hope you know. Okay. Okay. We're almost ready. Yeah, I think we're ready to start. Okay. Um, I. Sorry, I didn't do the polling. You guys get your tennis at. <laughs> silly. Uh. I'll turn on just so I have my records and I'll make my life a little easier than this mess that I needed. Okay, so I'll turn the attendance on. I will not do the polling questions. It's just stupid for me. It's a little embarrassing. Okay. Okay, uh, start class. Okay. All right, find them when you can, please. Um, in our last class, we discussed the separation of powers. And specifically, what happens when one branch of government asserts a power and the other branch of government doesn't really do anything about it. Right? So, for example, we have Korematsu, where President Roosevelt issued his executive order to detain Japanese Americans. And Congress really didn't do anything about it. And then we have Youngstown, right, where President Truman took ownership of the steel mills during the Korean War. And Congress really did nothing about it. And then we have Ex parte Merriman, right, where President Lincoln decided to um, suspend the writ of habeas corpus. And once again, Congress really didn't care. They went along with it, right? Um, those are cases where the executive does stuff, and, and Congress like, all right, whatever, that's fine. So it falls to private litigants, right? Private individuals to go to court to do something about it. Youngstown was a corporation. Uh, Merriman was a, you know, a person in a militia who was seized. And then you have uh, Korematsu, who was a, you know, American citizen who was held up in a camp. Um, the first case for today is very different, right? Um, Morrison against Olson, which is a classic case, is an instance where Congress takes an action to limit the president's power. And the president does not take it sitting down. The president actually fights back and asserts that that limitation on his power is unconstitutional. The second question is a similar theme, where the United States Senate, particularly the Republicans in the Senate, took actions to block President Obama's um, recess appointments to the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB. And then President Obama said, OK, fine. You won't let me do it this way. I'm going to do it this way instead. Um, and the case went to court. Now, the primary litigant was a corporation called Noel Canning, but actually the House represent I'm sorry, the U.S. Uh, Senate actually had a lawyer for Mitch McConnell, who was the minority leader at the time, who went to the Supreme Court. And actually the Senate minority was asserting in the Supreme Court their prerogative to block these sorts of recess appointments. So the two cases for today uh, uh, concern conflicts between the Senate and the executive. Okay? Um, so let's start with a basic question, and I think I'm just going to go back and forth. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, it's ev everyone, uh, everyone, everyone's on call today. Um, you are all on call. 
Um, but let's start, I'll, I'll actually answer this one, it's easy enough, right? Uh, the Constitution does not enumerate all the president's powers. Um, it simply doesn't. And one of the most important powers that the president has is the power to fire people, right? The power to remove subordinates within the executive branch. Even though that power is not expressly listed in in anywhere in the Constitution. So the answer to this question is false. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that, 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 that bonus for coming to class today. Um, but instead, Chelsea will ask you this question. Why is the removal power so significant? Why is that such an important attribute of executive power, the removal power? Ah, okay. So tell me about the take care clause. Um, it gives the president the power to um, basically take care of. Close, close yeah. 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 Okay. And then, so what does that have to do with removal power? So if the person is not acting faithfully or in the matter of the law, then the president wouldn't be able to. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think what Chelsea, I think what you're saying is, the president has this duty to execute the laws faithfully, and imagine a situation where one of the president's subordinates is doing something wrong, right? One of the president's subordinates is engaging in some sort of criminal activity, maybe, or maybe the subordinate is simply ignoring the president. The president says, "Go do A." and the guy goes, does B. Or maybe the, the president says, well, what you're doing is legal, but I think it's not a faithful execution of the law. And the guy says, too bad. Um, the essence of control of the executive branch, supervision, you might say, is a power to remove. You can threaten, right? You can give orders. But unless you can back it up with you're fired, unless you can actually remove these individuals from the government, then it's an empty threat. Now, I think the flip side of this, Tyler, is doesn't the president get to pick the people who work for him? In most cases, and I think that's, that's part of the, uh, the conversation about the difference between principal and inferior officers. Oh, sure. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute, I promise. But as a general matter, the president can pick his own principal officers. He nominates them by himself, and he picks them. Now, maybe the Senate gives a thumbs up or a thumb down, but right. the president picks his own people. Isn't that a good enough check? Shouldn't the president be able to know who he's selecting as honorable people who might follow his leadership and not going to you know, cause problems on the road. Why isn't the appointment power sufficient to safeguard against that sort of uh, dis disobedience that comes later? I think it, it's part of the, the equilibrium that's important between the separation itself, the mm -hmm. balance between the three branches of government as well. You know, we would like to think that there is a legislative branch uh, can still have a check and the judiciary can ultimately interpret. All, all true, but just a, a more, more narrow question, right? Why isn't the president's power to pick his own subordinates enough? Why is he also need the power then to fire? Isn't if you can pick your own people, then you can be assured they will follow your, your commands, your, your dictates? I think that's, that's why the other component is important. Okay, tell me why. Grant one branch an awful lot more. Ah, so, so in other words, once the person's in, then you're stuck with them. Okay. So on the flip side is, okay. So Chelsea, let's say the president has removal power, right? Why can't Congress limit that removal power? For example, we know for the president to appoint, say, a secretary of the treasury, he needs the advice and consent of the Senate. Why couldn't we enact a law in which? To fire the Secretary of the Treasury, you also need 
the advice and consent of the Senate. It cuts both ways. Oh, so you're saying that they may have given the consent to appoint Hamilton, for example, but they might withhold their consent to fire Hamilton. And why is that problematic? You're stuck, exactly, exactly, right? So imagine, right, that the Senate passes a law, or the Congress passes a law that says, you need advice and consent in the way in, and you need advice and consent in the way out. And if the Senate thinks, you know what, we think Hamilton's doing a great job, you're stuck with him, how then does that impact the president's ability to run the country? Now, this is not an academic debate. This actually happened. Um, in 1789, right, the very first year, you know, the Constitution of the Inquiry is not even dry yet. But in 1789, Congress considered a law that would limit the president's removal power. Specifically that in some cases, the Senate would have to vote when the president wants to fire someone. The Constitution's silent on this question. It doesn't say how to remove someone. The House voted, right, that the president has a removal power. Okay? The House voted that Congress should not be limiting the president's removal power. But the Senate tied. The vote in the Senate tied. Where half of the people thought that the Congress could limit the president's removal power, and half of the senators thought that the president's removal power cannot be limited. What happens when there's a tie in the Senate? Exactly. John Adams, right? One of the few things he did of actually any consequence as vice president. He cast a tie-breaking vote that the president's power cannot be limited. This is called the decision of 1789, right? It might sound insane today that Congress can put limits on the president's removal power, but if you read Hamilton, the Federalist, he suggests that Congress could. If you read Marbury, Chief Justice Marshall has a sentence in there somewhere where he basically says Congress can limit the removal power. So at the time, this wasn't such a clear-cut issue. But anyway, in 1789, the issue didn't really go anywhere, right? Because the John Adams cast a tie-breaking vote in favor of the president, unsurprisingly. Fast forward to after the Civil War. We're in the midst of Reconstruction. This was a very uh, tumultuous period. President Andrew Johnson was in office. And as it turned out, he inherited Lincoln's cabinet. Remember, President Lincoln was assassinated. And after Lincoln was assassinated, you had all these people who were already confirmed. For example, you had the Secretary of War. His name was Edwin Stanton, right? who was basically the one prosecuting the Reconstruction efforts. He was leading Reconstruction. Congress had enacted a law called the Tenure of Office Act. The Tenure of Office Act. Basically, tenure means you have to stay in your office. What does the law say? To remove the Secretary of War, the Senate must vote to give its consent. This was designed to shield the Lincoln holdovers. Why? The Republicans in Congress didn't trust Johnson because he was a Southern sympathizer. He was from Tennessee. Right? They did not trust him. The law said to fire Stanton, the Secretary of War, you need advice and consent of the Senate. Okay, what happens? Andrew Johnson determined that he was not going to listen to that law. He thought it was unconstitutional. So he fired Stanton. He fired him. What did Stanton do? Stanton said, no, not going to leave. He actually locked himself up in his office and refused to leave. We came very close to a huge crisis. Now, eventually, Stanton relented, and he left office. I mean, it, 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 there was a lot of fighting and you know, back and forth, but eventually Stanton gave up. But then the Republicans in Congress impeached Andrew Johnson. They impeached him. Why? They say that President Johnson disregarded the Tenure of Office Act, that he fired Johnson, I'm sorry, they fired Stanton without, get, without getting approval from the Senate first. The primary reason, not the primary, I think one of the primary articles of impeachment was that Johnson flagrantly disregarded the Tenure and Office Act. Right? 
this was such a significant issue that we almost removed the president from office for exercising the removal power. This is not a joke. This is a really serious matter that went to the heart of the interaction between the Congress and the Senate. I'm sorry, between the Congress and the president. Um, as history reveals, um, Johnson was impeached in the House. Uh, then we had a Senate trial at which Chief Justice Salmon Chase presided. And after the trial, the vote was one short. You need two-thirds to remove the president. They were one vote short to remove. Um, if you ever read Profiles in Courage by John F. Kennedy, which was a famous book, one of the Profiles in Courage was the, I can't remember his name, but the one guy who sort of voted to, to save the presidency. Um, you know, people complain about, we need impeachment now. No, that was serious stuff, right? You know, the situation we have today is, is <laughs> we, we were at the brink of another, another civil war. So Johnson stayed in office. Um, but that didn't resolve the question, right? Who was right? Was Johnson right? Or was the Congress right? Um, Johnson had his vision of the executive power, and the Congress had their vision of the executive power. Who was right? Well, let me say this much. Had Johnson been removed, I think the Senate would have actually made a constitutional ruling, not by a court, with a judge, but the Senate sits at a court. And I think the Senate, when it sits at an impeachment court, can make constitutional decisions. And had they removed Johnson, I think then the Tenure and Office Act would have been constitutional. But we don't have that ruling because it was a one vote short. Okay. Fast forward to 1920s. Oh, of course, please raise your hand. Just shout out. There's two uh, people here. Stanton could have filed in, in federal court, correct? He and could. No. Why did he not? And collect his salary? That was my exam question a year or two ago. My exam question was Edwin Stanton went to the Court of Claims and sought his back pay. It's actually a harder question, could he have ordered reinstatement? That was another final exam question I asked, right? Could you actually go to the Supreme Court and order reinstatement? Uh, my final exam last semester was actually a variant of that. Lincoln was impeached, removed from office, I think I mentioned this last week. Then Lincoln went to the Court of Claims and he sought back pay. And then eventually he wanted the court to say because his um, removal was invalid that he was still president, he should be reinstated. That was my exam question last year, final. Very difficult questions. Uh, to bring this even more current, um, Alan Dershowitz, who's a professor at Harvard, he's always on TV, you see him, right? Um, he's actually written that the courts can review the president's removal along the lines that suggest that if President Trump were removed from office, he could then sue for back pay, and then a court could then decide um, whether, in fact, the removal was proper. For example, if the Senate makes a decision on the Constitution that's wrong, could the, could the court review it? I am very skeptical of the Dershowitz theory. Um, I'll mention this briefly. The, the Constitution says that the, the Senate shall have the sole power of impeachment. Sole, S-O-L-E, right? Sole means the only power. And I, I put a lot of weight in that word that um, if the Senate has a sole power of impeachment, then other branches can't review it. I think that's probably the better argument. Um, there was a situation in West Virginia about a year ago, this was insane, um, where there were a number of justices in the West Virginia Supreme Court who were um, uh, basically accused of crimes. They were doing bezels. So some of them were bad, not all of them, but they were all pretty bad. And the, um, the Senate began an impeachment trial to remove these um, justices, basically wanted to remove the entire court, remove all of them. And then the Supreme Court of West Virginia issued a decision saying that the impeachment trial was improper. So basically the justices who were being impeached recused, and then basically a temporary Supreme Court was formed of other judges in the state who then ruled that the impeachment trial in the Senate was improper. And as a result, the justices stayed on the court. I was very critical of that decision. I, uh, the, 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 the notion of impeachment is a political remedy, and I think courts should not get involved. But there's no clear rule why they couldn't. Um, of course, there's also the issue if Chief Justice Roberts is presiding at the trial, uh, he might have to make evidentiary rulings. There was a trial by Salmon Chase of Andrew Johnson. Um, Chief Justice Rehnquist tried the impeachment of Bill Clinton, and they had to make some decisions. 
Are those decisions subject to appeal? Well, under the rules, the, the Senate can basically overrule the Chief Justice. Um, but is there an appeal from that to the Supreme Court? I don't think there should be. And the, forgive me, the point of that is that we should not have the Vice President do it. I mean, is that essentially... In the, in, well, the Vice President has no role. In the impeachment of the President, the Constitution says the Chief Justice sits as presiding officer. When that, forgive me, when that was written, were they still, was it still the, the runner-up was Vice President? Yeah. So it wouldn't be a party thing. They just felt that the Chief Justice... They, they need some of higher party. stature. Now, as it turns out, the Chief Justice uh, uh, has done this twice. Chase did it for Johnson, and Rehnquist did it for Lincoln. Let's see, Robert has to dust off the robes. I don't know. I, I really hope not. I don't want to. I was actually, uh, there was a hearing on Monday in D.C. where I was almost absent. They, the, the, the House asked me to come testify, but they got someone else, which was good, so I didn't have to go. But Yeah. But it, it just occurred to me, everybody always does seem to resign. I mean, they don't have to. Right, what happens if President Obama's cabinet officials didn't leave on the way out the door? Then Trump would have to fire them. Indeed, in what, it, this, this was actually happening. President Obama's, um, the number two or three person at the Department of Justice stayed on as a transition. Her name was Sally Yates. Yes. Um, usually the Attorney General is confirmed right away uh, so that the President has his Attorney General on day number one. Uh, but Jeff Sessions was uh, had a contentious confirmation process, you might recall. Yeah. Um, as a result, for the first week or so of the Obama of the, the Trump administration, um, President Obama's holdover was basically the Attorney General, and it came that President Trump signed the first travel ban, and Sally Yates announced that she would not defend it in court. She didn't resign; she said she wouldn't defend it, basically forcing the president to fire her. Generally, if, if a government official says they don't want to defend a law, they have to resign, which I think is the honorable thing to do. She basically forced Trump to fire her, and then Trump had to scramble and put someone else in the seat temporarily to help defend the travel ban. So it was a very tumultuous period, my goodness. January 2017 was a crazy time. It was a crazy time. But this all goes to the president's duty of faithful execution. If his subordinate says no, at that point, he had to fire her. And he made her, he made, you know, she didn't lock herself in the room. She left willingly, but she basically, you know, put a letter, you know, on top of the, um, uh, what do you call it, you know, uh, sent a letter to the press saying it will not defend this law or the executive order. All right, but let's go back to the Tenure of Office Act, right? Was the Tenure of Office Act constitutional? Um, Johnson said it was not. The Republicans in Congress said it was. Who gets to decide these disputes? And you might say, of course, the courts do. I, I'm not so keen. I think, the, uh, you know, I think Johnson probably had it right. Um, but it's, it's not a given the courts get to decide it. Now, the Supreme Court would pass on this issue in the 1920s, in the case called United States versus Myers. Or, damn it, was it Myers, United States, or United States versus Myers? Sorry, it's been a long day. Uh, oh God. I don't remember if it's Myers versus United States the other way around. Yeah, Myers versus the United States, thank you. I had it for the first time. Uh, 1926. Um, this case was actually fairly boring, right? Johnson's issue was, you know, the Reconstruction Civil War, like, you know, this, like, this crisis. Myers was freaking boring. Here's what happened. There was a postmaster, right? You know, the most insignificant, I shouldn't say that. Mail was actually very important before computers, so I shouldn't disparage the office. But you had a guy who was a postmaster. And um, the president told the postmaster, uh, you're fired. Now, the postmaster had protections, right? The postmaster protections, which said he could only be removed if the Senate gives his consent. And the postmaster, a guy named Myers, uh, didn't leave, and President Wilson basically fired him anyway. At that point, Myers sued for back pay, which is sort of the remedy that you do. You, you sue for your salary, right? Sue for your paycheck. If you had a if you had a five year contract and he fired you after four years, give me my one year salary. Um, the case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the court ruled in favor of President Wilson. The majority opinion was written by Chief Justice Taft. Now, Chief Justice Taft, as you know, was president. 
He's the only person to serve in both the U.S. Supreme Court and the White House, right? He served in both places. And Taft, unsurprisingly, had a very broad um, vision of executive power. I mean, this is not surprising to anyone. He was president. And he basically ruled that Johnson was right. He purported to resolve the dispute over Johnson and the Tenure in Office Act. Right? He ruled that Johnson was correct and that Congress cannot put limitations on the removal power. And I don't assign Myers anymore. I used to assign it. I think Morrison's adequate. Um, but the Myers case was this robust defense of executive power. He looked at the decision of 1789, and he said that Johnson was correct and that you should not have these removal restrictions. All right? That was 1926. That was the rule for a good, oh, I don't know, nine years or so. Fast forward to 1935. We are now in the New Deal. Now, we're not 1937 yet, we're 1935. Why is that significant? Because the justices were still skeptical of Franklin Roosevelt's powers. So we're 1935. And the Supreme Court decides another case called Humphreys Executor, H-U-M-P-H-R-E-Y-S, Humphreys Executor. Why is it Executor? Well, Humphrey died. Um, who was Humphrey? He was a commissioner on the Federal Trade Commission, appointed by President Hoover. Right? He was appointed by President Hoover. President Roosevelt told him when he got into office, thank you so much for your service. Your services are no longer needed. The guy refused to resign. Roosevelt said, I would like you to resign. The guy said, nope, not going to resign. So Roosevelt said, you are fired. Um, at that point, Humphrey sued for back pay. And he said, look, uh, I have this protection, which says that I can only be removed for good cause. No, it's not about the Senate voting. It's different, right? The statute says that the, the FTC commissioner can only be removed for good cause. What's good cause? Um, you know, neglect of duty, absence, perhaps incapacity. In other words, the president has to give a reason, a good reason. It can't just be, I don't want you here anymore. Thank you for your services. Uh, then Humphrey died. And actually, his, his executor of his state, right? That's why it's Humphrey's executor. The executor of his estate litigated the case. Funny story. In one year in class, I made a joke. Like, wonder if I, I, I was joking. I wonder if Roosevelt had him killed. Like, I was being totally facetious. Like, I was just making crap up. And someone on YouTube was watching. And he actually wrote to the DC Health Department and requested a copy of the guy's death certificate, which I have a copy in my office somewhere. Uh, he died of some sort of coronary attack. It, it was not, he wasn't off by Roosevelt. I mean, uh, <laughs> the craziest of people on the internet. I, you know, my videos are on YouTube, and some guy found, he's like, aha! And he actually mailed, he, he wrote to the DC Health Commissioner, and he has to mail me a certified copy of, of Humphrey's death certificate. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, Roosevelt did not off the guy. Um, that would have been pretty cool, but that's not what happened. Because <laughs> uh, we actually, I found his obituary, and it was kind of opaque of how he died, but some sort of heart attack or something, whatever. Not important. Okay, so then it goes to the Supreme Court. Again, this is 1935, right? The court had not yet gone anti-Roosevelt. And in 1935, the court ruled against Humphrey. Okay, the court ruled against Humphrey. I'm sorry, blah. They ruled, they ruled against Roosevelt. I'm sorry, it's been a very long day. Uh, it was a unanimous opinion, and they ruled against Roosevelt. Um, and the court held that Generally, like in Myers, the president has an absolute removal power for these sorts of principal officers as a general matter. But the commissioner of the FTC was different. Right? This was a five-member board, similar to the NLRB. Right? Three members were appointed by the president's political party, and then two members were appointed by the opposite political party. And they were appointed for six-year terms. And the idea was, if you had these bipartisan commissions, these bipartisan commissions that they would uh, be more um, faithful with the law and they would not be so political, they would get stuff done. It doesn't really work, but whatever. That's the idea. And because these 
these uh, individuals had um, uh, uh, different types of powers, they were not like the principal officer, like the postmaster, right? These commissioners had uh, powers to adjudicate, right? They actually had adjudicatory powers, judicial powers. They had powers to write regulations. They basically had these um, legislative powers. And they also had the executive powers, right? They, they, they were able to, um, you know, issue executive orders. Uh, not executive, they, they were able to, like, take enforcement actions if people actually violate the laws. They could find them and the like. So because these people have these quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial powers, okay, the court said these are different, right? The, the executive power doesn't let them be removed so easily. As a result, the court ruled that the four cause, what's called a four cause protection, right? You only remove them for cause, for good cause. The four cause protection was valid. And Roosevelt's removal of Mr. Humphrey was unconstitutional. And therefore, his estate got the back pay. Okay. Everyone with me? Okay, so then where does that leave us, right? We have Myers, which says for these principal officers, you have an absolute removal power that can't be limited by Congress. Then you have Humphrey's executor, which suggests for these sort of quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial officials, uh, Congress can put in a four-cause removal protection to insulate the president's removal power. Um, no one, a I shouldn't say it like that. Humphrey was primarily a rebuke of Roosevelt. At this point, think of like Schechter Poultry, they were mad at Roosevelt that he was doing all this crap. And uh, most people say this stuff carefully, don't think that Humphrey's executor was, a, was a, a well-reasoned opinion. It sort of made up this artificial distinction. Um, but it did create a, a rule that the president's removal power is limited. And after that, I don't think any president actually tried to remove someone for cause. I don't think it ever actually happened. Right? Roosevelt was very clear of saying, I'm removing you because I, I don't want you anymore. He didn't give a reason. And I think that actually makes a, a difference. OK, come with me. All right, so fast forward. Oh, god, a lot of exposition for this class. Fast forward to the 1970s, right? Uh, if you didn't watch the video for, did you both watch the video for the Watergate one? It, that, I think that's one of our, our best videos in the package. It's Randy's favorite one, at least. Um, During the Nixon administration, President Nixon was running for election in 1972. Um, he was very popular. He was going to win re-election. Uh, but one of the groups supporting him was called Creep, which is like the worst nickname ever, the Committee for the Re-election of the President. Right? If you're going to make up a nickname for like you know a political group, okay, don't use Creep. You, use something else. Don't use Creep. Right? Um, and for reasons that are still not entirely clear. Creep hired a bunch of crooks to break into the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C., uh, the location of the Democratic uh, National Convention's headquarters. By the way, that's, uh, Tyler, you ever go to the Watergate Hotel? So it's an apartment complex. You know where it is, right by the Kennedy Center? Yeah, in fact, Justice Ginsburg lives there, which is kind of funny and ironic. I once went to a, to a party there. It's really old. Like, all the apartments look pretty dinky. But Ginsburg, I think Condoleezza Rice lived there also. I think I saw a thing that she lives there as well. It's a nice location, it's right by the water, it's beautiful. Uh, but anyway, so these, these crooks, these burglars, right, they break into the Watergate complex and they steal some paperwork and, you know, I don't, but it's still not exactly clear what the hell they were thinking, but they did this. Um, the election happens in 72. People were aware of the break in, but it was like, so what? They didn't know who had organized it, who had you know, instigated it. Um, but at some point after the break-in, President Nixon became aware of it. He didn't know about the break-in at the time, but he learned about it later. And at the time in the White House, there were these recording devices, basically tape recorders, that would start uh, recording whenever a voice would come in the room, so they were automatic. He was uh, paranoid about this sort of stuff. And there were discussions in the White House tapes which suggest that Nixon knew about the break-in, and he was discussing ways to raise money 
to get the burglars to keep their mouth shut, basically bribe them to not uh, rat on the White House. Because if this was a random break-in, it's, you know, whatever, it's a petty crime. But if this was a break-in that came from the President's Committee, that's a big deal. Um, soon enough after the election, the public learned about the break-in and the affiliation with Creep. And the Senate started saying, we need someone to investigate this. And they didn't trust the President to investigate his own crimes. Um, Elliot Richardson was nominated as Attorney General. And during his confirmation hearing, Elliot Richardson pledged to the Senate that he would uh, pick a special counsel to investigate um, the Watergate situation. Now, special counsel is a term we all know today with Robert Mueller, uh, but this was a time was basically a prosecutor within the DOJ who had some independence, right? It wasn't super protection, but it had some protections, right? They had a little bit of autonomy. And then um, Leon Jaworski uh, was appointed. I'm sorry, El Archibald Cox. Jaworski was the second guy. Archibald Cox was appointed as a special counsel. Um, after some investigation, Cox recognized that Nixon had these recordings in the White House. And he issued a subpoena to the president to deliver the tapes. Now, it wasn't, he didn't ask Nixon to testify under oath. But he asked him to deliver the tapes. And Nixon refused. Nixon said, I have an executive privilege. And he raised a host of arguments about why an executive branch employee cannot be forcing the president to hand over the tapes. Think about it, right? It's like, you know, you work at a company and you demand your boss to do something for you. And it's like, no, 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 it's, it's the other way around, right? I'm the president, you're some little executive, you know, special counsel. And he, Nixon was probably right about that part, but the Supreme Court rejected it. Um, the Supreme Court said that there's no absolute claim of executive privilege. And in particular, these documents were requested as part of the criminal trial for the burglars and the conspirators, right? They wanted these tapes to help exonerate them, to free them. So this wasn't the special counsel requesting them for his investigation. These documents, uh, sorry, these record, these tapes were requested to facilitate trial and have a fair trial for the defendants. That's an important point that most people forget about Nixon in the US. Anyway, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously, uh, Rehnquist was recused, but they ruled unanimously that Nixon had to turn over the tapes. Um, and shortly after the tapes were turned over, Nixon resigned. It was over, right? He was done. There was no way he was going to survive that because he's basically on tape admitting his stuff. There was actually a lot of litigation later where the tape should be revealed to the public. Uh, there was another case called Nixon versus GSA where Congress passed a statute saying that Nixon must deliver the tapes to the government. Because when Nixon finished his term, he basically brought all the tapes with him. Uh, and then Nixon asserted that there was a bill to tainter, that the statute named him and only him to deliver these tapes. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, no, 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 it's not a bill of attainder, because it mentions other presidents as well, just only this president was in office at that time. So eventually the tapes were delivered to the government, and they were released some years later. All right. But long story short, the special counsel proved adequate to an extent, um, but Congress thought they needed more protections for these special counsels. Um, so Congress enacts the EIGA, the Ethics in Government Act. It did a lot of things, but in particular it created a mechanism for the appointment of an independent counsel. Again, distinguished between a special counsel, which was like Jaworski and Cox and Robert Mueller, versus the independent counsel. Right? The special counsel, Jaworski and Cox, were not given that much autonomy. But the independent counsel, like Alexa Morrison and Ken Starr, whose name you probably know, were given a lot of autonomy within the executive branch. So I'll do the facts of the um, Morrison uh, case in a minute, but I want to start off by walking through the um, operation of the, of the EIGA, right? How, how are these independent councils authorized? All right, and I'm going to stop talking. My mouth hurts. Uh, Chelsea, so walk me through the process, please, of how these independent councils were 
uh, appointed under the EIGA. Okay, good. Okay, and then what, what's he required to report? Um, okay, specifically, the AG must decide first if there are reasonable grounds to believe that a prosecution is warranted. Not whether you can get a conviction, simply whether an investigation is warranted. That's not a high standard, right? Basically, if Congress comes to the president and says, we think a crime was committed, it's going to be very difficult for the AG to say, you know what, I don't think there's any investigation warranted. We're done here. So it's almost an automatic that when these referrals were made to the, independent, I'm sorry, to the Attorney General, he's going to have to rubber stamp it and say, oh, you know what, I think there's enough here. Okay, once the Attorney General makes that finding, he comes to the, uh, what's called the Special Division. Um, this is a three-judge panel. Uh, of the Court of Appeals of the D.C. Circuit, right? And these three judges will then appoint an independent counsel and define the independent counsel's prosecutorial jurisdiction. In other words, what they can investigate. Um, it's usually pretty broad. And it's not fixed. The independent counsel can come back to the court and ask for more jurisdiction. And let me tell you, it's going to be hard for the court to say, no, no, you can't investigate that. Uh, so as a result, it's almost automatic that once you make a request for an independent counsel, they're going to be appointed. And once they're appointed, they're going to be in office for quite some time. And these prosecutors have one job and one job alone. They're, 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 their jurisdiction is limited to whatever the court approves, so they can't go investigate other, other matters. Um, now, the important aspect that you have to keep in mind is the president cannot control independent counsel, right? Uh, their jurisdiction is defined by the court. Moreover, and a, the relevant to our discussion today, the president cannot fire the independent counsel at will. The attorney general has to assert there's independent, I'm sorry, there's good cause to fire them. And in fact, the independent counsel can challenge her removal in court to determine whether it actually was good cause. Right, the president can't say, you know what, I think you're doing a wonderful job, but I think we've had enough investigation, let Mr. Olson go. That will not fly. Or the president can say, we need to move on, we're wasting money here. Right? No, no collusion, no, no obstruction. That, that sort of thing would probably not be good cause. All right, so if I understand how, oh, everyone, do, do you, my two, my two star students, right? Uh, understand how the EIGA operates? Sure. Okay. Now some more backstory. This part's actually fun. How did the ethics, sorry, how did Morrison v. Olson start? Neil Gorsuch's mom. What? True. In the early 1980s, President Reagan nominated for the secretary, or sorry, for the administrator of the EPA, one Ann Burford Gorsuch, who was Neil Gorsuch's mother. Um, and apparently, I, facts are always blurry, but apparently Gorsuch's mom uh, said some stuff to Congress that maybe wasn't exactly correct. And Ted Olson, who was a lawyer within the executive branch, uh, he later became actually George Bush's Solicitor General. Uh, Ted Olson uh, apparently gave some advice that maybe wasn't accurate either. And the House went on this long investigation about whether Olson perjured himself or they committed perjury, which is a crime. And eventually, after this long process, the executive branch got a referral from Congress that Olson testified untruthfully. And they gave a report to the Attorney General. And the report said that Olson violated the law. That report was enough to trigger the EIGA, at which point an executive, I'm sorry, an independent counsel was appointed to investigate Olson, and this took years. The three-judge panel picked Alexa Morrison. Okay. Ted Olson then challenged the constitutionality of the executive of the independent counsel. Right? 
I think what happened was Alexa Morrison had requested some documents from him and also said, um, no, you are unconstitutional, I'm not giving you a damn thing, right? That's how it came to court. Uh, so the case goes to the court, and it was 87, 88, I'm sorry, I was off by a year, 88. And the case splits seven to one. Uh, Justice Kennedy had only been confirmed fairly recently, so he didn't sit on this case. I've actually tried to find out why, and I can't get a good reason, uh, but he wasn't on the case. So it was seven to one. Uh, Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote the majority opinion, and then Justice Scalia wrote the lone dissent. Now, um, let me just pause here for a moment. I've been teaching this case now for almost six or seven years. And for the longest time, uh, when people talked about this case, they said, you know what? Scalia got it right. Like I saw Judge Kavanaugh, before he came with justice, Judge Kavanaugh gave a speech at my law school some years ago, and he said, he, oh, the title of the speech was Justice Scalia's Dissents That Should Become Majority Opinions, right? I think that was the theme of his speech. It's on YouTube somewhere. And one of them was actually Morrison V. Olson. I said, yeah. So for the, for the longest time, we thought, yes, yeah, Scalia got it right. That changed after Robert Mueller was appointed. It almost like the, the moment Robert Mueller was appointed, people said, you know, we need independent counsel again, right? You know, we, we need to bring this back, this structure that we had for all these years. Um, and I think a lot of the wisdom which we gained from Scalia was quickly lost as soon as it became politically expedient. So I, I well, I still think Scalia was 100% correct. I think Rehnquist didn't even lay a glove on the guy, uh, didn't, even, didn't even touch him. But Morrison is the law, and it's not Scalia's dissent. Uh, you know, Judge Kavanaugh had an opinion when he was trying to audition for the Supreme Court, where basically cited Justice Scalia's, oh, did I say that loud? Uh, uh, it was one of his last big opinions, it was a dissent, where he basically cited Scalia's dissent over and over again. And you know, we tell you in legal writing, don't cite dissents, never do it. Uh, but he kept citing the dissent, and there are a number of judges who keep citing Scalia's dissent. I cite it myself, I'm allowed to. Um, are there still five votes to uphold Morrison? I don't think so. I, I, I think if, if this issue, had, had the Mueller issue came back to the Supreme Court, which thankfully God didn't, I don't think there were five votes to uphold Morrison. Now Mueller might have won on other grounds, but I do not think the court will reaffirm Morrison. Um, especially Roberts, because Roberts was a Reagan lawyer. He, he hated this case, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure Gorsuch was still pissed they went after his mom, so he probably had like you know, a little like revenge to, to be had. Okay. Any other questions? Is this the, is this, um, the one where uh, Justice Scalia gave the metaphor for the wolf? This wolf comes as a wolf, yeah. Can you explain that? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, we'll get to Scalia at the end, I promise we'll do that point. But let's start walking through the, the three main separation of powers questions at issue in this case. Um, the first one turns on the appointments clause, right? So here's the appointments clause I have up on the screen. It says, the president shall nominate with the advice and consent of the Senate, shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all the officers of the United States, whose appointments are not here and provided for or, and which will be established by law, semicolon. But the, pre, but the Congress may, by law, vest the appointment of such office, inferior officers as they think proper in the president alone in the criminal courts of law, in the courts of law, heads of departments. Okay, so this tells us a few things. So first, there are something called inferior officers, right? Whoever these people are. And Congress can establish an alternate path to appoint them. The president can do it alone. Alone means he doesn't need the Senate. Or the courts of law can appoint them. Or the heads of department, that is the principal officers, you might say, right? The Secretary of the Treasury. Now, why are the courts given the power to appoint officers? Well, think about it this way, right? What if you're a clerk in a court? Do you need to get confirmed by the Senate to be a clerk in the court? No. What if you're a courtroom reporter or a courtroom deputy or, or something like that? Courts need to appoint their own officials without going to the Senate. So for inferior officers, you have basically a streamlined path. Now what if you're not an inferior officer? The phrase principal officer does not appear anywhere in the Constitution. But that term has emerged to say, if you're a principal officer, then you're not inferior. And if you're inferior, you're not principal. You know, you're either or, either principal or inferior. 
If Alexa Morrison is an inferior officer, that's fine, because she's appointed by the courts. But if Alexa Morrison was a principal officer, it's not OK, because she was not confirmed by the Senate. Right? So uh, Tyler, uh, Tyler, how does Rehnquist resolve this first question? Is Alexa Morrison a principal, or is she a inferior officer? That, that she's inferior. She reports to the Attorney General. She's got a very narrow jurisdiction, uh, as well as a specified tenure to serve in that position. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me ask you a follow-up. Can the Attorney General supervise her? Yes. To what extent? What can he, or let me ask the question differently. In what respect can the Attorney General supervise her? Scope, um, completeness, or substantial completeness of the task of the jurisdiction given by special division. Can the Attorney General define her jurisdiction? Cannot. But he can determine whether it's complete or substantial. And, and what if the Attorney what if Alexa Morrison says, no, I'm not done yet? Could she litigate that issue? If she's removed, if, if he says... You're done. You're, are, yeah, you're done. Yeah. She could, and I think the burden of proof would be on the AG to say, show so, substantial completion. So how effective is that supervision? Yeah, it, it, there's some there, right? There's some supervision. I, 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 th I think you're exactly right, Tyler. But it's fairly constrained, right? Because you know at any point if you say, OK, Alexa, you're done, and she runs the court and says, no, I'm not done. You can't, you can't, you can't fire me. I didn't finish my job, right? You think I'm done? I'm not done. I didn't finish. And I think she'd win that case. Um, Rehnquist, again, says that she's inferior in rank to the attorney general because she's limited jurisdiction. Scalia responds, this is insane. She said she's not subordinate to everyone. You know, the essence of being subordinate is that someone can tell you what to do, right? You, you are in the Marines, my friend. When your commanding officer tells you to do something, you do it. It's not, OK, let me go ask someone else for permission. It's, it's, it's you get an order and you do it, right? So the entire notion of having this sort of free-floating, independent counsel, Scalia says, who is not subordinate to anyone in the executive branch, not even the president himself, is not possibly inferior. It must be principal. Um, so Scalia says, because it's a principal officer, it has to be confirmed by the Senate. There's no other way. And to that, did, did anyone try and tell um, completeness versus substantial completeness? Did um, any of President Clinton's attorney general, uh, Albright maybe, I don't remember, um, try to tell Kim and Starr that you're done? Say it again. So it wasn't, I mean, that's, I think that's one of the cases that goes to Justice Scalia's point, is mm -hmm. the amount of money that um, Special Prosecutor Starr spent investigating the Oh my God, yeah. Did one of the, the AG, Albright or whomever, ever? Well, Janet Reno was, was the Reno. Attorney General, and she was a bit of a, she, 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 she was hands off. She didn't want nothing to do with it. it, it she, she didn't touch it at all. She basically let Ken Starr do it. I mean, she had no choice. Um, Clinton's peoples, though, Carville and the other guys, they were criticizing him every day. The same sort of vitriol that Trump threw at Mueller, Clinton's people threw at Starr. It was the same, maybe Starr deserved it more, uh, it was the same sort of attacking his credibility nonstop to diminish his, his integrity. And did, forgive me, did he do Whitewater and the... L Lewinsky. The well, the special counsel was appointed because of, uh, Whitewater was a real estate transaction, right? The special counsel was appointed to initially investigate the real estate stuff, but that spilled over into Lewinsky. And every time, Ken Starr would keep asking the, the court to expand his jurisdiction. So this was, OK. So years, this was like years. Term one into the and, 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 oh, yeah. Really and Ken Starr wasn't always the, uh, the, the, the independent counsel. It was originally someone else. I'm blanking out his name. And Ken Starr stayed through at 98. And then he resigned. There's was was another guy who finished it up. Uh, my co-counsel in a case named Robert Ray. Uh, but it went on almost the entirety of the presidency. Wink, wink, nod, nod. It's n not, nothing's new. OK. All right, so the first question again was, was she principal or inferior? Um, and the court said she's inferior. Now let me tell you. if. Alexa Morrison was inferior, then Robert Mueller was also inferior. He has even less freedom 
than uh, Morris never had. Mueller could not be, f Mueller had far less autonomy than did Morrison. So if Morrison's correct, then Robert Mueller was also inferior, and there were, there were not appointment clause challenges. Um, and the courts consistently rejected those. Okay, with me? All right, the second question concerned the good cause removal standard. All right, this was the same issue in Humphrey's executor. Remember, they can only fire the FTC commissioner for uh, a, a, good, a good reason or a good cause. Um, and Rehnquist found no problem. He says that this removal provision does not, quote, unduly interfere with the president's exercise of executive power and his constitutional duty to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. In other words, the president can still execute the laws faithfully even with this good cause removal standard. Why? Well, if there's a good cause to remove her, he can get rid of her, right? Why would, he, why would the president want to remove her for a bad cause? Again, the court, oh yeah, the, the court would not entertain the idea that the president doesn't need a reason to remove her. Maybe the president decides it's a waste of money. Or maybe decides it's causing a distraction. Maybe deciding that they should focus their priorities elsewhere. But those would not be valid reasons. Scalia counters that this is an impediment to the president's power over the executive branch. Are with me. The third part of Morrison concern, you know, the broad, what's often called the separation of powers. That the president, his power to control prosecutions was now being limited. Um, Rehnquist agreed that to some extent the independent counsel is independent. But he says the executive branch still has sufficient control over her. Um, Scalia, again, vigorously dissents on this point. He says, the Constitution vests the executive power in the president, right? Not in the president as other person or not some, some powers here, some powers there, all of it. And prosecuting crimes is an executive power function. It's not a power that can be delegated away from the president. Congress cannot give the president's prosecutorial power to a subordinate who does not answer to the president. The whole purpose of the law is to deny the president control for the prosecution. And the court says, that's fine. Scalia says, no, it's not. Is there any questions on that part of Morrison? We'll get to the Wolf part in a minute, I promise. I did get the idea. I don't know if uh, Scalia refuted this or not. Um, one of the things that is the act is very broad. They say yeah. good cause, mental incapacity, physical disability, but Humphreys they say specifically cause defined as neglect of duty, inefficiency, um, what's it, malfeasance yeah. you know, in the job. It's extremely narrow. Uh, it, do you recall if, uh, if it, it might have been in there, if Justice Scalia argued the contrary to that Humphreys is different because it was narrowly focused on what good cause actually is? I don't. Um, and really, the court's never gotten into exactly what good cause means, right? So for example, neglect of duty. Could that be as simple as not following the president's requests, right? Could it simply be the president has priority A, and the officer chooses priority B? Could that be neglect of duty? Um, you know, there's ongoing litigation. I mentioned Brett Kavanaugh's uh, Supreme Court edition tape. Uh, there was another opinion from the D.C. Circuit where uh, Judge Griffith noted that if you read neglect of duty broadly, then you don't really have a problem, right? If neglect of duty means he's not doing what the president wants, then there's always going to be good cause, and that the statute doesn't really burden anyone. If you read it like that, then it provides almost no protection at all. Any reason would be a reason. If Trump finds that Robert Mueller is wasting his time and not investigating Hillary Clinton instead, right, then he could fire her because that's not that's neglect of duty. Right, so it all depends on how narrowly or broadly you define these terms. Make sense? All right. Let me do the last part, the Scalia quote. This one, I mean, uh, Justice Kagan gave a remark a couple years ago where she said, um, Morrison v. Olson, the dissent, Scalia keeps getting better and better. And people 
thought she meant that his opinion was correct, but she was actually talking about the writing. And I actually, I think I said it wrong for one or two classes, but Kagan was referring to the president's writing. Oh, sorry, Scalia's writing. And Scalia writes frequently, an issue of this sort will come before the court clad, so to speak, in sheep's clothing. You know the expression of wolf in, uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? Where basically a wolf dresses up like a sheep so he can sneak in and hide around with the sheep and eats them all? In other words, you have a very dangerous assertion of executive power, but it's wrapped up in this like lovely cover so it doesn't look so bad on the outside. All right, so usually when cases come to the Supreme Court, it's really bad, but it looks okay on paper. Uh, the potential of these sort of principles to affect important change in the equilibrium of power is not immediately evident and must be discerned by a careful and perceptive analysis. In other words, you have to really look carefully to see why this is dangerous. But the Ethics and Government Act is not like that. It's bad on the outside, bad on the inside. There's not a wolf in sheep's clothing, but this wolf comes as a wolf. Does that make a little more sense? I've I seen that bobblehead, and I had no idea yep. what. Yep, it's, yeah, if you go to my office, actually, my Scalia bobblehead's at home. I'd bring that to school. I'd keep that for my personal inspiration. Um, but it, there's a little wolf on it. And uh, it says, this wolf comes as a wolf. It's in the last clip of the video, so I put a picture of it. Yeah. Uh, I remember I was, I was in Law Review, I was a 3L, and we had this issue on Law Review where this like, advisor was trying to exert too much control over us. And I actually wrote a memo to my colleague that said, this wolf comes as a wolf. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, even back then I was incorrigible. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Scalia again was a lone dissenter. Um, but I think at least most people recognize that Scalia probably had the better logic, if not the constitutional argument. After the lengthy investigation to Kent Starr, Congress decided not to renew the Ethics and Government Act. Right, this was after the Clinton impeachment. Kent Starr basically recommended impeachment. It was a disaster. Um, anyone who thinks impeachment's a good idea really needs to go back and live the 90s again. It was not. It didn't work to anyone's advantage. And said Congress allowed the Ethics and Government Law to lapse, and instead Attorney General Reno, uh, she died a few months ago. She died fairly recently. Attorney General Reno um, issued these regulations, which are still in effect, and that was what uh, allowed for the appointment of Special Counsel Mueller, who had his own two-year uh, investigation into the Trump administration. <sighs> that case takes an hour. It always does. It's a long case. Important case, too. All right, questions on Ethics and Government Act, Mars will be also removal power. Okay, nothing? All right, let's move on. We'll do the second case. Um, the first, ca actually, we're probably doing this backwards, but the first case is about removal power. Uh, the second case is about the appointment power, right? Specifically, Article 2, Section 2. It says, the president shall have power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. And there are two terms I want to clarify at the outset so we have our terminology straight up. Intra-session recess means a break within the session. So for example, Congress goes home for the weekend, right? Christmas break. Uh, you know, a summer break, that the session is continuing, right? Each session lasts about a year, right? So if a, a session is one year, within the session, there are going to be some breaks, right? They're not working 24 7, 365. They're not going to do that. But after one session concludes and another session begins, there's a single break, an intercession recess, right? Inter, like internet, between. The intercession recess is when one session begins and another session, I'm sorry, when one session concludes and another session begins. Uh, nowadays, the intercession recess lasts maybe a few, maybe a second, right? Usually Congress gavels out one session and gavels in a new session. Uh, but originally, you would have a several month break between sessions. Right? And in fact, Congress didn't really take any long intercession recesses. Most members of Congress didn't actually live in D.C. They would go to the Capitol for a short period, do all their business, they'd work around the clock, and they'd get the hell out of town and go home for the summer. 
that have these long breaks between. But in their modern practice, you have lots of, sh lots of breaks within the session, but virtually no break between the sessions. All right, let me give you some more backstory about uh, Noel Canning, which was a very important case when it was decided. Um, in recent years, um, the president of both parties, both George W. Bush and Barack Obama, uh, had difficulties filling their administrations. Uh, the minority party in the Senate was able to block or filibuster any nominees. So, for example, when George W. Bush was a president, the Democratic minority used a filibuster to block the appointment of lots of people, uh, judges, uh, people in the executive branch, as well as members of the Na National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB. This was a, 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 a five-member commission charged with enforcing labor law. And like with all commissions, when they drop below three members, when they have one or two, they don't have a quorum. That is, they can't transact business. They can't do anything. And the goal of the Democrats was to basically shut down Bush's NLRB. Okay, fine. Fast forward to Obama's presidency, and we have the opposite situation. Republicans now were in the Senate minority, and they were filibustering President Obama's nominations to the NLRB. Again, nothing's new. Everything just flips around. There's no principle. It doesn't matter. Right? Same, same crap. Right? So then President Obama said, okay, fine. You won't approve my picks. I will make a recess appointment to the NLRB. Right? During a recess of the Senate. Okay. So the Republicans said, okay, that's nice. We won't let the Senate go into recess. So the House Republicans relied on Article 1, Section 5. It says, neither House during the session of Congress shall the consent of the other adjourn for more than three days. The House Republicans established a rule that the Senate Democrats couldn't recess for more than three days. As a result, the Senate never broke for more than three days at a time. And the goal was to keep the Senate in session to block Obama recess appointments. Right. It, it, I mean, it's ingenious, right, in its simplicity. <laughs> um, Obama said, okay, that's fine. I'm going to make an appointment during those three-day breaks. Now, the Office of Legal Counsel had previously advised the president that he can't make this appointment, but Obama got a second opinion. Right? There's nothing new with presidents getting second opinions. It's just, well, this, this current's crap, right? Um, and his lawyers advised him that he could make an appointment during the three-day break between these pro forma sessions, but they did it in a sort of a different way. They argued that these pro forma sessions, right, where someone comes in, gavels, and leaves, is not really a session of the Senate. That effectively, because of some of these short, like, 30-second sessions, they're not real. And Obama said, look, the Senate's been in recess for a few weeks. This is plenty long. So in the president's mind, it wasn't a three-day break. It was actually a break of several weeks. Okay. So during this three-day period, or several weeks, depending on how you count it, uh, President Obama made several nominees to the National Labor Relations Board Okay, on recess appointment. They now had a five-member quorum. Maybe it was four. But at least they had at least four members, I think. And they issued a judgment against Noel Canning, which was a, a, a bottling company in Yakima, Washington. Right, in Yakima. Um, Noel Canning refused to go along with the enforcement action because he said that you are not a properly constituted federal agency that your quorum is invalid, that the members of this board appointed during the recess of the Senate were not validly appointed. Um, the case goes to the Supreme Court. And this was huge. In my mind, this was probably the most significant violation of the Constitution during the Obama administration. Uh, it, it, th this was actually really a big deal. Um, and President Obama lost 9-0, right? I mean, it, it's, I used to make this point. When Justice Ginsburg finds that a Democratic president violated the separation of powers, it's serious. Right? This, was, this was not, this, now, now, the case was unanimous, but I think it's split 5-4 on the important question. But all of them agreed that you, the president can't simply deem the Senate in recess whenever he wants them to, that the Senate gets aside when they're in recess. Um, but this case is important because I think it really articulates how Justice Breyer 
and Scalia see the, the world differently. Uh, Justice Breyer worked as a Senate staffer for Senator Kennedy for many years. His goal is making democracy more functional. Justice Scalia, the formalist who believes in rules, says you read the text for what it says. Stick with the text. I don't care what else happens. And this case also implicates the concept of the gloss that we read about in Frankfurter on uh, Youngstown, that when lots of presidents take some actions, how should that affect the scope of executive powers? But here, unlike with uh, uh, the Frankfurter stuff, Congress didn't acquiesce. They were fighting back. And Congress didn't like when the president made these appointments. Um, if you want to read the entire opinion, I know you have no, all this free time, but this is a very important opinion. I used to assign my students the entirety of it, and now I have other things to assign. Uh, but it's a very significant opinion where they go through the history meticulously. All right? Everyone with any general questions? All right, so let's start. And I broke this clause down into three separate clauses, and I want to take them one at a time. Okay? So you have vacancies that may happen, the, and recess of the Senate. So let's start with recess of the Senate. Okay? Did this provision apply to intersession recesses, that is, the break between the sessions? Or did the recess of the Senate apply to intra-session recesses, that is, the break during a particular session, like Christmas break? OK, so Chelsea, d describe the Breyer position here. Good. Um, and he also felt that the clauses, or the word recess itself was ambiguous. Right. So it's not just recess, but the recess, right? Well, I want to focus on both words, like the recess. So, Chelsea, let me ask you a question. If I say the table, how many tables are there? One. Right. If I just say during recesses of the Senate, what would that suggest? Not one. Okay. Why does Justice Breyer think this text is ambiguous then? It seems clearly as clear as day. Scalia says dub means one, right? It's, it's this one table, one recess. Um, because he mentioned that um, it gave the president the power to continue the government, the federal government. To no, you're right. I mean, that, that's his argument of why he chose plural, right? But if the first starting point is text, you only go to the sort of purpose argument if the text is ambiguous. What's ambiguous about the recess of the Senate? No, it's not. Right. I mean, it's, I think Breyer it says, OK, we'll start with the text. But I think he's actually starting with purpose, right? If we start from the idea that the purpose of this clause is to keep government open, then it would be very dangerous to have only um, the ability to fill vacancies during that single break between sessions. But keep in mind, at the time of the framing, you had a very long break between the sessions. And you had very few short breaks, right? And when you had a session in play, Congress was in town. And presumably, Congress could then fill a vacancy. In other words, if you had these short breaks during the session, then why couldn't Congress fill them? If Congress was out of town, you were between the sessions, and yeah, you would need this. And as Clear argues, the reason why the Constitution doesn't specify which recess we're talking about is only one recess to talk about, which is between the sessions. But Breyer is very much focused on keeping government functional. Right? And he finds ambiguity to ensure the continued functioning of the government. He looks at uh, historical practice. Now here, I think he's on a stronger footing. If you have instances that presidents made recesses during the uh, uh, intra-session uh, appointments, that suggests that maybe there's a gloss. But here, we know that Congress has opposed this. Right? There's lots of lobbying and fighting this long simmering dispute. So there's not the sort of continuous, systematic, unbroken practice that Frankfurter described in Olcani. By the way, Breyer cites Frankfurter, he does not cite Jackson, which is why I've become over Frankfurterian over the years. Okay? Scalia says, no, there's no ambiguity. There's no reason to consider historical practice. It's straightforward. Okay? 
And Scalia raises another argument, right? If recess means any break, would that include like a lunch break, right? You break for lunch for half an hour. Um, and really, Breyer has no response to, it to this point. For Breyer, I think a lunch break would probably be enough. Maybe, I don't know. <clears throat> okay, the second one turns in the word happen, right? So, Tyler, how does Breyer read the phrase vacancies that may happen? He says something kind of funny. Uh, he says the most natural meaning of the word happens, at least to the modern ear, yeah, is yeah, exactly. when it initially occurs. Yeah. Uh, so he was focusing on um, the, the pre-recess vacancy specifically. But, but he didn't go with the most natural reason, or natural reading. Which What did he find about this text? That it was open to the more broad interpretation that the filling of the vacancy regardless um, was kind of, uh, I don't know what the, the right verb is, uh, usurped by the fact of the recess. Regardless of happens, yeah. during recess was the predominant phrase. Yeah, and once again, Breyer found ambiguity, right? He thought the phrase was ambiguous. Even though vacancies that may happen, I, I think means vacancies that arise during the recess of the Senate, Breyer said that the clause applies to both vacancies that happened before and during the Senate. You can imagine, like, let's say someone dies while the Senate is in recess. Okay, then the president can fill that. But if the person dies the day before the Senate goes into recess, then that can't be filled. Right? Scalia says this is insane, right? Happen is a word, and it has a meaning, and the court basically reads it out of the Constitution. Um, and the court should not defer to the executive as well. Now, Breyer counters that there's history. Right? For the last 100-odd hundred years, 200-odd years, uh, presidents have filled vacancies that arose prior to the recess. So how do you deal with that? You have this long practice. Scalia says, but the practice is in dispute that members of Congress oppose those sorts of appointments. This, again, is a, is, is a dispute. Um, the last one, I think, is the only point where uh, Breyer's reasoning, I think, is most suspect. Um, is, are these three-day breaks, or are these actually breaks of a few weeks? Right? President Obama said that these short pro forma sessions don't count. They're not real. And Breyer holds that the Senate is in session when it says it's in session, provided that it can have the capacity to transact business. That's a completely made up standard, right? Uh, it's, you know, this, is, this is like, this is peak Breyer. Um, but so long as the Senate's able to transact business, then it's in session. And the President can't tell the Senate when they're in session. And then Breyer's just one line. He says, uh, in light of historical practice, a recess of more than three days, but less than 10 days, is presumptively too short to fall in the clause. So 11 days is good. Three days is not good. What about four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? Uh -huh. Justice Scalia says this is basically made up. And let me tell you an actual example of when this almost created a disaster. Justice Scalia died during the recess of the Senate. I think I was one of the first people in the world to recognize this fact. Not the first, I think, but I was one of the first. And I quickly checked the calendar and said, holy shit, the Senate will be in recess for eight or nine days. Uh, it might have been 10, but it was, it was right at the limit, right? And then I, I wrote about this in my book. I, I frantically called a friend who was working in the Senate. I said, you. If you stay in recess, then President Obama might make a recess appointment to the Supreme Court. That would have been a baller move had he done that. Um, so, and this, this has been reported, um, but apparently McConnell, who was a Senate Majority Leader, told Obama, unless you pledge you're not going to do this, I'm going to come back into session tomorrow. And then Obama made a pledge that he wouldn't make the recess appointments and then everything. But I mean, because of Breyer's wishy-washy three is 10, whatever, you had a potential like event of monumental importance, right? By leaving this, and, and the irony was, Scalia was criticizing, don't you realize, you fool, but leaving this open, you're creating all these problems. And then when Scalia died, the exact problem he forecasted came to fruition, not even two years 
two years before his death. Well, we'll never get another one like him. But, you know, can you imagine if the, someone then challenged Supreme Court justice as not being properly appointed that the recess was too short? What kind of disaster would that be? That maybe the judgments that were judged, the, the, the rulings that judge made it then thrown out? Could the Supreme Court even hear a case in which your colleagues may accuse being illegitimate? It would have been such a disaster. And then Obama, to his credit, didn't do it. I, I, I had a mini panic attack. That is February 13th of 2016. I, had, I went through every emotion that day. I was like, despair, loss, panic. I had all of them just one back to back. I remember I called Randy. I was like, Randy, they're in recess. He's like, oh my god, they're in recess. It was like this, 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 this bizarre day. What was that guy's name? Merrick Garland. Garland, yes. Merrick Garland. What, what is, what's he doing now? He's sir? still the chief judge of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. He's, he's doing well. Um, he's a nice guy. Very, very nice guy. Uh, but I was acutely aware of this opinion, which I had taught a number of times. And I was like, OK, Scalia warned us this would happen. And it's happening. Um, but Obama didn't make a recess. All right, so in the end, the court was unanimous that the appointments were unconstitutional, but they divided over how to understand the recess of the Senate and the vacancies may happen. Uh, and to this day, the issue is open, and I'm afraid it will arise in a time where people can't work out a deal, in which case we now have to litigate, well, if it's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine days, maybe 10 is enough, I don't know. As a practical matter, though, it's unlikely this will ma make a difference because the filibuster was eliminated. Uh, in 2013, Senator Harry Reid used what's called the nuclear option, which basically means that there are no more filibusters for executive branch nominees. So the minority party can really no longer meaningfully stop appointments. So they don't need to make recess appointments. They can just appoint them in a regular session. So I don't know how much juice this actually has. But with the Scalia thing, there was a, there, at the time, there was still a filibuster for Supreme Court. And President Obama may have simply decided to uh, make a recess appointment, put Merrick Garland or someone up there. I, I thought that would happen, but I was wrong. So what's the, uh, what's the deal with that, sir, um, the nuclear option? is Why didn't, I guess a Republican majority had it anyway, so he wouldn't have been confirmed one way or another? No, no, McConnell, I mean, with, with the Garland thing, he would never even had a vote. Um, had, 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 I mean, well, had, I mean, Obama nominated Garland, and the Republicans took no action in the Senate. They just let the nomination die. It, I think it was the first time ever that a nomination was never voted up or down, and there was no hearing. It just sort of died. Usually they get voted down. Even Robert Bork was voted down in 87. But he came back up with uh, Justice Gorsuch, right? With Justice Gorsuch, the Democrats filibustered, at which point the Republicans used what's called the nuclear option. It's called nuclear. It's a rule change. With a simple majority, you can change the rules. And with a simple majority, they eliminate the filibuster for Gorsuch. And then with Kavanaugh, the filibuster was gone. OK. Questions on null canning? I have like a simple question. Please. So before they got rid of the filibuster, how would anyone get appointed if they were always? There was a time, Chelsea, where there was bipartisanship in Congress. Okay. And um, let me say, there are two steps, right? In the Senate, there are two separate votes. The first vote is what's called cloture, right? Cloture means can we end debate? There's a second vote is we actually confirm the person. The, de the filibuster happens on the first one. So long as a minority wants to continue debating, there's no floor vote. So historically, you would have senators who would vote to end debate, but then vote against the nominee. Or they would vote for him again. I mean, just so Justice Scalia was confirmed 90, 98 to 0. I think Justice Ginsburg had like 97 votes. Right, Justice uh, O'Connor, I think, was confirmed unanimously. Right, there was a time, fairly recently, where judicial nominees were simply voted unanimously. Uh, often, you'd have what's called a voice vote. They wouldn't even register a vote. They'd say, "Okay, anyone object? No. Okay, you're a justice." Uh, but today, it's extremely contentious and, and brutal. Okay. Are there any other questions on null canning? All right, our class begins on Monday. I hope we have more than two people, but we're starting over moving to the 14th Amendment. 
um, I, I don't have to tell you, but I encourage you to watch the video on the history of the 13th Amendment. It's very good. I think it's almost like 20 minutes long. I think it's her longest in the entire library. It's almost like a sitcom length, but uh, it, it gives you a very good overview of our next few weeks. But we are basically halfway through the class. We are done with um, this material. Uh, on next Thursday, a week from today, I'll be giving your midterm. I mean, it's not, it's not a real midterm, but you know, it's from, from last semester. And so just come, and uh, Tim, who's uh, your Langdell, will be administering. Did you guys go to, to the Langdell? I did. Pat, were you the only one there? Um, okay, so you're going to be the only one there now. Okay, very good. All right, anything else, guys? All right, I'll see you guys later. Have a good weekend.